Hi. Well, welcome to all of you. Um, so good to see everyone. So good to see some um, familiar names and some familiar faces. I think this is our first call since the uh, summer break. Everyone's busy with back to school. I hope it's a good start of the school year. Uh, my name is, for those of you that are joining us for the first time, I know we have some familiar faces on here, but if this is the first time you're joining us, my name is Brenda Kessler. I am with the Children in Nature Network. Um, I co-lead this space with our partners at the Trust of Public Land. Danielle, I saw you joining there. Good to see you too. Um, I'm also joined by a couple of my colleagues here. If you can wave, I see Priya Cook, Michaela, and Anne off my screen. I'm sure we might have some more later on. Um, I am going to share my screen. We have a uh, great speakers lined up for today on our topic, which is district-wide assessment. But before I go into that, um, if you can rename yourself um, and share your pronouns, your location and um, your native land, and organization name, um, Green School Yards program, if any. And also, if you're i um, happy to entertain our icebreaker. Uh, we would like to know what's one of your favorite uh, features from your local school ground? What's one of your green schoolyard features that you, um, that you really like? Or it could even be something that you've come across in a different place at a different playground that you enjoyed seeing. Swings, yes, we. <laughs> those are always nice to see. Uh, and feel free to, you know, either unmute yourself or type them in the chat. Rain gardens, exploration areas for learning. Yes, stormwater infrastructure, bioswells. Well, we can keep those coming um, as we continue our our chat for today. So we are joined by. Tara Buckner, urban planner of city of the city of Atlanta Parks and Recreation Department, and Daniel Drake, uh, senior executive of director of facilities for Atlanta Public Schools. And like I said, our topic for today is di district wide assessment. That milestone that um, our initiative or the initiative of green, building a green schoolyard initiative initiative usually goes through um, to. Uh, pinpoint the site selection and, and areas that are um, high priority areas with equity in mind. So I'm going to let Priya, uh, who has been at the forefront of the Atlanta efforts as a, as a TA lead with, uh, at least on the Children and Nature Network side, to frame a little bit um, of what we are discussing today and the efforts that have been going on in Atlanta. Thank you, Priya. Thanks, Brenda, and I'll be quick because I know most of all we all want to hear from Tara and Dan, um, but I just wanted to take a moment to sing the praises of all the partners in Atlanta, which includes um, nonprofit partners, Trust for Public Land, um, and uh, Children Nature Network, NLC, and Kaboom, but really the um, local leaders at the city of Atlanta in Parks and Rec, in the mayor's office, in Watershed, and um, within Atlanta Public Schools. This is um, really, a, it's about site selection, but I think it's a really a much bigger story just about 
uh, all these disparate partners coming together and really thinking about their values and their priorities. Um, and it's been really inspiring to be a part. It's not easy work and there's just incredible commitment in Atlanta and building off of so much great work that many others on this call, I see you Ruth, <laughs> um, have been part of for a very long time. Um, and so like Brenda said, we'll hear the, the narrative and the presentation will be recorded, but you know, the discussion and the breakout group is very purposefully not recorded so that we can all be really candid about the challenges and successes you're having locally in asking honest questions and giving honest answers um, from our presenters. So um, without any further delay, I will pass it off to Dan Drake of Atlanta Public Schools. Thank you, Priya. Uh, good afternoon. If you could, yeah, if you can stand that slide. Um, thank you. Uh, Dan Drake was Senior Executive Director of Atlanta Public Schools over facilities. Uh, it's been a great journey here that Atlanta Public Schools has had with our school yards, school parks, and I'll talk a little bit about how that name has changed a little bit. So um, back in 2019, you'll see on the screen there's multiple um, stakeholders, but the first two stakeholders were Atlanta Public Schools and the Trust for Public Land. And it, and it was also um, another one called Park Pride that's not shown on here. So we worked together since 2019, it's been four years. Um, we have an MOU with them and we have 10 pilot projects with them. Then in 2022, this expanded to all the players that are shown in the screen where we had children Children and Nature Network that came in as facilitator and technical assistance. We had Kaboom that came in as our second implementer. A Trust for Public Land was the first one. Then we had our public entity partners. That's the City Parks Department and, and how the our school yards, which became known, then changed to school parks, could be a park for the citizens and how they could help with some of the, the, the park deserts. And then the Watershed Department came in as well and how their green infrastructure initiative and how that was installed at miles and then we have other uh, future partners that are coming like west atlanta watershed etc so it's been a great progress of great partnership it started at atlanta schoolyards and now it's atlanta community school parks acsp we, we've known each other as that now and we're now implementing this together um in partners uh next slide so what what we came together uh, started about a year ago it was in um, uh, the fall of last year, where all those partners we just talked about came together, and we had on our hands was how do we figure out which schools we should be bringing our school parks to, so. There was a five stage process, which actually we're still in stage five, uh, actually stage, stage five was when we're actually we're still deciding for the spring and, and other ones next year. So stage one was where all the partners brought in their uh, data collection, their data issues. So um, Atlanta Public Schools brought poverty, transiency, student achievement, school climate rating, and race for each of the schools. And that was how, what, how we looked at it. Each entity brought their own lens. The Parks Department brought their Health Equity Index, and Tara Buckner will be spending time um, after this to talk in detail about that. Trust for Public Land brought their Park Serve and National Community Schoolyard data, looking at the number of people within a, within a ten minute walk. Kaboom brought its Play Equity Index. So we brought all those together and we were able to narrow down our more than 90 sites down to 29 priority sites. That was a quite a process where we had to kind of blend together all the data, blend in our priorities because some of those priorities conflicted with each other. And I'll give you one example um, in that. The, that example is that um, the parks department wanted to, um, fund and focus on the, the schools that were near the parks, while Trust for Public Land was looking at it for the park deserts where there's not a park. 
And so we kind of had to blend a lot of that together. We had some very healthy discussions um, and we're able to actually blend that together to get down to our 29 priority sites. We continued that, pro that journey together in stage three, where we went from 29 sites to 20. And then there was actually site visits of those last um, 20 sites where we where trust for public land kaboom and the various partners went out and looked at a couple uh components specifically at what is the size of the play space what what kind of play structure components are on each site both the components the surface material as well as the condition are these in in in, in good condition or, or not the natural features such as tree canopy and the, whether the presence of an outdoor classroom, they looked at other site features, including fencing, amenities, benches, all of that, environmental conditions, including if there's excessive heat or shade, percent impervious surface, if there's flooding. They also looked at community access. So where is on the school property, where would that, that playground or play field or schoolyard how easily accessible is that to the to the community? And then readiness, including principal buy-in. And it, it's, it, we can't say enough about how important it is to get buy-in from the school principals on this. I mean, there's only so much that we can do in the facilities in the district level. It really comes down to that buy-in of the principals. Then we also looked at in that school, would there be any planned renovations? Um, and when was the last time that schoolyard or school park was updated? So that was stage four, that quality and usage assessment and observation. And then stage five was then we really got down the brass taxes for this fall, which sites are we going to look at for a kickoff? And we did, we, Kaboom got their first site at FL Stanton, which is a, a renovation. So again, that stage four review allowed us to, to, to get to that. And the TPL had two sites at Hope Hill and Benteen, and those are supported by the Parks Department. And actually, the funding for those two ones that TPL, Trust for Public Land, is doing were are funded by Parks uh, because both Hope Hill and Benteen were nearby parks. So you can see, and 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 you can see how all these various items got brought together. Next slide. I. Now, this next slide, I'm not expecting anybody to read this, but I just want you to see just a quick look as to like how we looked at every school We had the various columns. The pink ones were the school characteristics and we had green and blue and all the everybody blended all their items together. And then the very, very left were the different prioritizations. We had a, a prioritization that looked at uh, different weights. And I will tell you one thing it was very helpful that we had a neutral facilitator that helped us through this process. So Children and Nature Network brought in Karen Horsch as, Horsch as a technical <clears throat> assistance provider. She came in and provided and was able to facilitate and crunch the data and do the weighting and do all the, the, that stuff that, was, that helped us uh, to get to where we need to be. Uh, next slide. Um, I will say one thing that happened over the last three to four or five years is that there's been a change in our risk culture, specifically here in the facilities department, to even allow this. Um, there's a lot of facilities folks out there that will say, we don't want folks to come in after hours and, and take in all of that liability and all that potential damage. And so I just wanted to show you a couple of things, which is, here are the signs of, this is our typical signs that we have out here at the schoolyard. So you can see Atlanta Public Schools logo, you can see Trust for Public Land at the bottom and all of their, all of their supporters where they were able to get their funding, all the funding for that Trust for Public Land for all those 10 schoolyards, they fully funded the entire thing with the support of Arthur Blank, Delta, Georgia Power, Georgia Pacific Foundations. You can see all those listed at the bottom. You can see the the the, Intent is that these the school parks, school yards are open dawn to dusk outside school hours. So that's after school, on the weekends, and all summer. On the right side is just a, a sampling of our schoolyard rules. And this is just how we were able to uh, provide 
both risk management facilities and security folks that we had some ability to um, have some some um, comfort with allowing this um, opening. Again, we exposed ourselves a little bit of, but but it was a positive thing. Um, you know, so that was you know the partnership as you can see in the signs, the rules, and then the other thing that we we've, we've done with this is that we've a lot of times we put fences around this and. But again, it's fences with gates and the gates are the important part. So we have the fences up so that it's that the schoolyard, the school park can be used by the school during the school day. The students are protected. And then after hours, those gates are open. So it's fences, but it's gates for open access after school and the weekends. One thing, lastly, my last point here before I turn it over to Tara is that both Atlanta Public Schools and the Parks Department are working on a joint use agreement. We're currently underway. We're modeling it after the Grand Rapids uh, a joint use agreement that they have between the school and the city parks. And thank, thank you, Grand Rapids, for that. And it's it, that is really an offshoot of this work that we've done here together. Um, and so it's and that will help memorialize instead of just having the school yard and school park at these 10 sites. And as we expand, it'll be for all elementary um, schools and those parks uh, that would allow that. So at, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Tara, uh, who will be talking um, about um, her data and, and her equity index. Thank you, Dan. Um, let me just uh, say that um, it's a beautiful thing to, to be in partnership with Atlanta Public Schools. At one time, uh, historically, we were one in the same. And um, the, the split uh, precedes me by decades. But um, it's been quite interesting. Uh, to have come in this position about three years ago and um, realized that we're still working out um, things um, that, you know, are part of our history that need to be, still need to be worked out. And really uh, the wonderful um, partnerships that are um, being created from this because everybody has the same aim and that is uh, providing um, more uh, green space to, um, to children, starting with our mayor um, and his uh, Year of the Youth initiative. Um, let me just uh, roll right into, um, are we ready for um, my, my slide? <laughs> So I'm just going to start by talking to you a little bit about Activate ATL and its impact, uh, as well as what we've done with our, our Park Equity Data Tool. So what is Activate ATL? Um, it is our comprehensive master plan, and it was developed uh, over a two-year process uh, and approved in December of 2021. Um, it's part of the city's comprehensive plan and integrates um, the Atlanta city design of the values of access, equity, progress, ambition, nature, and other citywide and individual park plans. The three main goals of Activate ATL are to invest in parks and recreation, connect our internal and external resources, and grow our overall system um, over the next 10 years with a special focus on equity um, and expanding park access so that all Atlantans live within that 10 minute walk of a park or green space. Um, so um, we have this in place and, you know, the thing uh, about Activate ATL is I always feel like, you know, you build it and great things come because um, once we um, put Activate ATL master plan together, we immediately established a strategic plan 
uh, and, um, and then we also uh, promoted our equity data tool. Our strategic plan covers the first five years of Activate ATL, so we are um, right now working on um, accomplishing those tasks. So um, the other piece of that is, is that citywide, um, thanks to our taxpayers, um, we recently, in um, May of 2022, um, they approved a, a series of bond initiatives, which we call Moving Atlanta Forward. This resulted in 147 million for our park improvements. And then we also, after uh, 25 plus years, uh, got an increase in the millage. So uh, we are also able to, to use those as tools to help us move um, our parks and, get, and getting access to, to our um, citizens. Um, um, moving that forward. So I'm moving Atlanta forward. And why is this so important? Because our city is growing and we are expecting, uh, we're right now around uh, 500,000 people in our city and um, we are expecting to grow uh, with the region and add another roughly 250 to 300,000 people. So we know that our park system right now is not access and, and um, access to parks is, is going to continue to be a challenge. So we're working on that. Um, the um, the uh, equity data tool that we created um, is an effort to to increase or to, to be very focused about and very deliberate about equity and, and addressing equity in our community. And so um, one of the things that we did as a part of Activate ATL is we evaluated every single park and green space. Uh, in a very short period of time, um, I have seen 380 parks. Um, along with my, my colleagues as well. And I wanna say I did all the evaluations myself, um, but we have, uh, we looked at those parks, we ranked the quality of those parks and um, we put them against roughly 54 determinants of health um, in our community. And we came up with um, a, um, a score for each one of the parks. Uh, once we got that score, we ranked them and um, we created a list that we call in, uh, our parks of greatest need. So over the last year, we have been working um, on the first 30 or the top 35 parks of greatest need. And um, again, the resources that we have garnered um, through, um, through the, the initiatives the bond initiative and uh, the millage have been of great uh, service to us in helping that. But realizing that our city is growing, we um, early on understand that uh, understood that we have to um, partner in order to develop this green space. And so, working with um, Atlanta Public Schools, where we're serving uh, some of the same uh, children. Is, is a natural partnership. And so um, this is, as I said, this is kind of a historic um, partnership because I would say when I first came to work here, it was very difficult to have conversations across the aisle. And as Dan talked about um, the MOU that we are putting together, um, it's, it's really, um, it's, once it is uh, complete, it will be uh, of great benefit to our whole city. So um, our relationship, um, uh, I, I feel like everybody is on board and uh, nobody feels anybody is overstepping and there are even smiles in the negotiation. So um, uh, we are moving Atlanta forward. <laughs> Thank you, Tara and Dan. So.
Oh, Brenda, are you unmuted? <laughs> I, I was trying to unmute myself. Um, I, I do want to just skim through the these slides, Tara, the, the last one, this, I know this is part of the observation and the site visits that the partners did. And um, if you want to, <laughs> I don't want to continue with the talking points or maybe Priya, you want to go through some of these. I know we have the joint vision too. So I, I think what we're looking at is are some of, some of the indicators that um, I think Tara, you're in this picture <laughs> along with someone else clad in their rain gear because it was two rainy days when um, this cross agency, cross partnership um, group went and walked all those um, top priority sites and we're taking a look at the reality on the ground and. So I guess this is just a, um, a sampling of some of the indicators that you all were looking at there. Um, I, you know, certainly invite you and Dan, if there's anything you want to add about that particular process or what it was like kind of taking in the physical reality of the spaces together. So, you know, of course, you know, I'm always evaluating how they work for, for kids, but one thing um, that comes to mind is we visited a site that some time ago, um, be, the <laughs> the building was actually um, being used and and owned by uh, Atlanta Public Schools, but there was a pool there that hasn't been used in many many years, um, and so um, it, but right outside there is a a, a great park. Um, it has uh, foot, a brand new football field. It's, you know, um, state of the art, um, beautiful space. Um, and um, I, I think um, the, the, the fact that, um, you know, we need to, you know, that was a great opportunity to talk about the history of that pool and what it used to be and what it's used for now, which is um, it's closed to to um, to the children, but to think about um, how that works with with our system and with Atlanta Public Schools, it was really, I mean, conversations that um, haven't happened for for a very long time. Um, these site visits allowed us to do that. To talk about, um, I, I look at the the fencing issue. Fencing is a big issue for those of you on the call, um, because um, you know when people leave, you don't know what is happening, and um, you know I, 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 um, because our I, I would say um, an example is you know when, when you have a public space. Um, people uh, use that space and they don't consider that it's just, it's a public space, it's for everybody and they use it as their own space. And so the fact that schools um, have tried to, you know, keep gates around their schools um, to keep children safe, um, this piece right here um, is, is, is huge um, because again, it's, the kids in the neighborhood are going to be coming to the school. They, they will be able to, where especially where we don't have parks, they will be able to, to go and have picnics and um, explore and play, which is so important for the kids. Here's the joint vision statement. Yeah, do you want me to talk to that for a second? Sure. So this was early on, it was pretty much last, it was probably January of this year, where it took us a while and it, it, having the joint vision was important. And we had parks at the table, we had Atlanta Public Schools at the table, we had all Kaboom and Children's Nature Network. And we went, we went back and forth and we said, okay, we're going to try to have everything done in 10 years. And so the vision is that every APS school should have a community school park that supports the healthy development, success, and well-being of Atlanta's kids and communities. Again, with the focus on kids, um, focus on open access and to this stuff. So it was 
it was a collaborative process. It took some time. It took some, you know, even some of our board members were in on that. So um, uh, it was one of the earlier things that we did. And then it really led the how we were going to go start looking at the selection of the sites. Dan, since you're mentioning that, I thought this is a related question that someone asked in the chat, Liz in Flagstaff um, had asked, she was wondering what some of the most significant barriers were to the partnership and how you've been able to overcome them. Um, welcome to both of your insights on that. Sure, I, I, I'll say if, if there, you know, there were some barriers, you know, again, how some of those items of, of the different perspectives. I'm just saying the whole umbrella of the ACSP, the Atlanta Community School School Parks Initiative, the fact that we came together, we have monthly check-ins through the uh, guidance of the Children of the Nation Network, that just though having the lines of communication open is allowing us to start having these conversations and 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 to finish conversations, not to just start them, but also to finish them as well. So um, it's been it's been a great effort and any type of things that come up, we, we're able to have direct conversations and, and go through them one by one. And thank you for Sarah, do you want to add anything to that? Questions. Oh. <laughs> have to know how big it is to be able to have these conversations across um, across the two groups. Um, that's all I'll say. <laughs> I know there were a couple other questions and Dan, thank you for addressing them too. Um, Oh, I, we have one more from Colleen. I see, are fence schoolyards locked during the school hours? And if so, how do you maintain uniformity in locking and locking schedules? Sure, yeah, uh, generally they're locked. Now there's a couple schools where the schoolyards are like way at the front and they're really not even, there's a few that are, aren't really used actively by the school, but the majority of them are and they're locked and we have our custodial staff whose job is to lock and unlock at the various times of the day. So we have that uh, through our custodial staff that does that. Um, can I, there was a question about high schools. Um, this question is your vision says all APS schools does not include high schools. I will say that's been one piece that we're still working on. High schools typically have a lot of athletic fields that we, um, so right now in our negotiations, right, with Department of Public War, Department of Parks and Rec for the joint use is that we're focusing solely on elementaries, not even middle or high schools for that. We're going to take baby steps on this. We're going to work with, we are saying all playgrounds and play fields at elementary schools. That's the focus that we're looking at. And it's all playgrounds, but they're typically going to be at, at elementary schools. Um, so that's that's our focus right now. And high schools and middle schools, because of the athletics, that's still there may be opportunities where we have non-athletic fields where that could be used, but that's we haven't gotten there yet. Um, question was, do they get locked up at night? No, they don't. They they are they're open, um, and they open up all night. And now there was, there is a few locations where we may have had, um, where we um, may have to lock them up at night. We're talking about Hope Hill possibly locking that up at at dusk, and that the Parks Department will be doing that for us based on that specific. But generally, they're open. Um, and if we have either abuse or any type of things, we may either have to try to lock them at night or try to find someone to lock them at night because we don't have the staff to do that. Or you may have to start restricting the, the school parks access at that point. But we haven't gotten that far yet. Thank you so much, Dan and Tara. Um, 
sorry. And, and again, we will be moving on to um, our breakout rooms to continue this discussion. And, and I welcome uh, all of you to um, just bring those questions, right? This is the space for peer sharing. We won't be recording. I'll stop the recording and bring up, bring your questions to, to your peers. Sometimes it's, you know, you never know who, who has the answers. Um, let's, I don't, oh, I thought another question came in. Um, I'm going to open those up. It, it will assign people automatically. Um, so we don't have set topics for each breakout room. We're just continuing this conversation. And again, welcome to this honest exchange. Yeah, right. This is the time to exit.